good morning and welcome to Yakima Covenant Church. This morning our service has a little bit of a different theme and there'll be some opportunities during the service both with prayers of the people and at the end of our sermon to take some time to reflect and to pray and to connect with God. Um, if you need more time than we've provided, please by all means just pause the video, go reflect and pray and then return when you're able to or you'd like to do that. Um, we want this opportunity to be meaningful to you. So with that, take the time that you need for it. Uh, before we get into the service itself, we do have a couple announcements. Uh, one is that Bruce Mortimer and that team that's going to be doing the cleanup on April 9th, we'd like you to sign up. So for those of you who come into the uh, sanctuary or the service this Sunday in person, feel free to do so right in the, um, the lobby. But for those who don't, please contact the church and let us know if you're going to be a part of that service so that we can plan accordingly. And uh, just make sure we, have, we know we have enough food and enough uh, opportunity for everyone who comes. Um, the other thing that I'd like to let you know is that we will have a special message from Habitat for Humanity following the service. So please stay tuned after the service happens to watch that video from Habitat for Humanity. So we'll start this morning off with Yakima Covenant Kids sharing a song. Enjoy your morning. need to work on our motions a little more. Than... <laughs> I'll admit I didn't get the turning around part myself yet, but in the time I'll do that. Go ahead and be seated. Let's, uh, let's begin with uh, prayer as the children have already led us into worship. Let's, uh, let's bow. God, we give you thanks that uh, nothing that you've made, uh, uh, you love us, you forgive our sins, when we come to you, we just desire to come to you. May you light our ways. We come confessing our sins before you, and may we receive your full, perfect forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are, as that first video showed you, we are entering into Lent, the start of Lent right now. 
I got to let you know something. In my little re research, I found out uh, that Lent uh, actually comes from a, group, a, a word back in the Latin, an uh, Italian name that means quarantine. So, <laughs> in some ways, I'm asking you to go into 40 more days of quarantine. But it's a good quarantine. It's for us to uh, kind of uh, pull back, allow ourselves to allow God to do some new work in us, because our theme this year is get, uh, make ready for new life. So again, welcome to Yakima Covenant Church. If you're here visiting, uh, we, if you're looking for a church home, we would love to be that church home for you. If you'd like to know more about Yakima Covenant, please uh, seek out one of the pastors. And then, I want to invite Sylvia up for prayers of people uh, to, and the others who are going to be involved in this uh, entering into uh, praying in many different areas for um, our church. And uh, I think specifically for this uh, exciting opportunity to reach our community. But those who are praying, come on up. That'd be great. So we want to enter into a time of prayer as a congregation. Prayers of the people are just that. They are prayers provided by different voices, one goal, one spirit, and one petition to a God that hears every single petition. He hears every single request, every sigh, and every single unspoken word. So this morning, listen not only to your own heart, but to the heart of another. For we don't know what burdens each one of us carries. So this morning, join me and let us pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, we bring before you this church. We bring before you its people, its needs, healing for those who need healing. And give us a servant heart that we may grow in your word, that we may grow in numbers, so that ultimately, Lord, we will grow your kingdom. We pray this morning for all that walk through our doors, that they may know that your Holy Spirit, it dwells here. And may they find your love among your people. Amen. Let's sing again. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power. Send us grace. Dear Lord, thank you for the children in our church. And please be with kids that are sick in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Lord, we pray for this, our children community. We pray that we will hear your word and know you. We pray that we will accept you as their Lord. Help our church to find ways to reach out to Yakima. Dear Lord, we today we pray for all the children of the world. We pray that you protect them. We pray that, you, that they can feel your love today. Help us to be thankful and love people around us. Amen. Lord, listen to your children pray. 
Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Merciful God, for over a week we have watched the invasion of Ukraine with anguish, outrage, anxiety, sadness, and compassion. We are grateful that the free world is united in its response to this crisis and that leaders have shown restraint in avoiding an escalation. We are grateful that attacks on nuclear plants did not release toxic radiation. However, the people of Ukraine are alone in suffering the devastation, the death and the horror of this conflict. And so we ask for your shield of protection around them. We are grateful that Ukrainian history has made her people brave, strong and resilient and that they have an inspirational leader in President Zelensky. Thank you, Lord. We know you are a God who desires freedom for the oppressed, and that against all odds you had the young shepherd boy David overcome the giant Goliath, and so we pray for the success of the Ukrainian people in the defense of their freedom and in overcoming their powerful oppressor. We know that you are a God of peace and justice. And so we pray for the success of diplomacy and for the end of the violence and suffering in Ukraine. Lord, have mercy. We pray for relief for the Ukrainian families who now find themselves refugees in a foreign country with just a suitcase to their name and often separated from their loved ones. We pray for the safety of those trying to escape the warfare and for those who are sheltering in bunkers and underground tunnels. We pray for those who grieve the loss of a loved one and who see their homes and streets ravaged by bombs and missiles. We pray for all who suffer from this war and ask that you give them your comfort, faith, courage, hope, and peace. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. I invite you to pray at this time. whatever the Lord lays on your heart. Lord, we confess that we don't turn to you, we don't come before you with prayers of thanksgiving, petition, confession, often enough. You invite us to do so, to pray without ceasing, your word says. So we do this now. Let's sing one more time together. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace.
We are now in the third uh, Sunday of Lent. Um, Lent, you know, is that time of season of honesty about our sin. Lent, a season about repentance and lament, mourning. Uh, lament, not something we often talk about, but something I want us to focus on, as this is the same text as we looked at last week. Today, I think when we th often think of mourning, usually it's a response to the death uh, or loss of someone. Uh, never weep except I think really around funerals. Back in the American revivalism time where Christianity spread like wildfire across America, uh, most revivals had what they called a mourner's bench. Uh, it was a church pew uh, bench, often no cushion on it. Uh, it was for repentant sinners to say and to think and sit there about and think about their sin or weep or, or mourn over their sin. Today, we're more apt to mourn over the loss of someone we love than to uh, ways that we sin or rebellion or cause God a sadness. What causes you joy? What moves you to laugh? Is it an old movie, Abbott Costello movie? Is it a, when your team wins the final four as we're thinking about March Madness these days? You can tell a great deal about people about what's humorous or funny or delightful for them. The converse is true. What causes you grief? What moves you to tears? Uh, is it March Madness when your team loses? Is it someone you love that's uh, no longer there? Joy, laughter, and delight, uh, fine indicators of love and, and things that we value. But I believe your grief and tears, lament, uh, unfailing indicators of what we value the most, uh, what we cherish the most, or our deepest, our deepest love. Uh, I don't know if Jesus actually broke down and cried in our text, I do know Luke says that Jesus lamented. Uh, he lamented the state of Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, stone those who I've sent to you. How often I've wanted to gather your people as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you didn't want that. Look, your house is abandoned. Matthew says, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. It gives us the very shortest verse in the Bible that Jesus wept. Wept over Jerusalem. Luke doesn't say Jesus wept, but it's hard to imagine Jesus uttering these very words without weeping. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets. You stone those I've sent to you. How often I've wanted to gather your people. Just as a hen gathers its chicks under her, ch under her wings, but you didn't want that. How revealing. Uh, how revealing for Jesus who is on the road outside of Galilee, long distance from Jerusalem, but already the storm clouds are gathering. Uh, there's a heaviness that's starting to begin. Uh, as Herod, he says, uh, Herod's out to, the Pharisees say, Herod's out to kill you. They warned by the Pharisees and Jesus' premonition, a rejection for suffering over Jerusalem is setting in. The Pharisees tell Jesus, Herod, the most powerful man in all of Judea, is out to kill him. Jesus just brushes it off, dismissing Herod, dismissing him as nothing but a fox. But then... Jesus falls into lament, a, a grief, a sense of mourning. He's not mourning over Herod's plans for him. He's not over uh, his eventual fate about his own life, but he's mourning the state of Jerusalem itself. Great Old Testament professor Walter Brueggemann defines Israel's practice of lament as a public processing of pain. I like that. That's what we got here. Jesus laments Israel's fate, a public processing of divine pain. Divine pain over an opportunity missed, for an opportunity that's been offered and then missed it. The Pharisees are missing their opportunity to care for people. And it's enough to make Jesus weep. Jesus laments. He's lamenting of what might have been. Lent traditionally is that season of repentance, uh, 40 days to mourn. Mourn all the ways we have disappointed ourselves, disappointed our God. Disappointed by the way we've lived, 
by the things that we've done, by the things that we've left undone. And when you look at the state of our lives, when you look at the state of our church, our church and just in general, our nation, our world, let's just look at the past two years. We have much to mourn. Uh, we need to make space for lament today. Jesus looked at Jerusalem and he wept. He gathered all of himself, uh, all to himself, that it, like a mother hen would gather its chicks, and he laments. Jesus still laments. He still laments the state of our communities, the state of our lives, our church, our nation, our world. Yet by God's grace, there's still time for us to turn, to return, to repent. Repent, Yakima. Repent, United States. Repent, world. Let ourselves and allow ourselves to be loved by the God of love. Yesterday marks, interesting, yesterday marks the second anniversary of the beginning of the pandemic that was first identified, I think, in Seattle, a nursing home uh, uh, where it started shutting down uh, the church around March 19th. It's important for us to consider the emotional and spiritual effects of these past two years. The world around us has shifted, left some scars, emotions that are new, uh, like grief and loss and anxiety and uncertainty. Others, racial wounds that have been reopened, unsure how to be received. Portland Covenant Church, uh, which supports an MLK school that's right next door, vandalized us recently. There's some that are hesitant, some that are fearful of the big group setting still as masks come off and others just are ready to resume. Past two years, did you realize we've had 21 people that have passed away in our own congregation? Larry Osink was the last funeral where we were together, stormy and came together and we grieved. Someone just came back and commented to me, they look around at our church and wonder where is that community that they once knew? Uh, many changes and people that are come back that are new. Uh, many experiencing the emotions simultaneously. Feelings of loss and grief are normal, but what we do with them is important. I think the start is to take time to lament. There's an Eisenheim altar in France that was painted in 1513 in a chapel at a hospital for plague victims a plague that broke out in France, a small village that's outside of Burgundy. I look forward to going to see that on sabbatical in summer 2023, to go and see a painting that would sought to identify the incarnation of Christ with the people through this plague. According to most authorities, Matthias Grunewald was an artist whose pictorial art of the Middle Ages is summed up and brought to its highest point. A work that's not only spectacular, the altarpiece is incredibly moving. The altarpiece is a multiple series of panels. In the front panel, Jesus' death on the cross. On the second, Grunewald painted the Annunciation, the birth, and the ascension, resurrection. Henry Nouwen writes about his experience of visiting that altarpiece. Although he said, I read two books by Wilhelm Niesen uh, before visiting, the reality surpassed any descriptions. When I saw the body of Jesus on the cross, tortured, emaciated, covered with abscesses, I had an inkling of a reaction of the plague stricken, the dying sufferers that happened in the 16th century. His compassion on the cross is depicted there. On the altar, they saw their God, the same superating ulcers as their own, and made them realize with a shock what the incarnation really meant. They saw solidarity and compassion, forgiveness and unending love brought together this one suffering figure. They saw that in their mortal anguish, they had not been there left alone. Lament. Lament is meant to be that of us realizing Christ has compassion of entering into our pain Lament of whatever pain you're experiencing. Lament is a prayer to God, uh, help in the midst of pain and struggle, a cry in, in the midst of God's incarnation. The Bible's full of 
these kinds of prayers. Lamentations, uh, it, it, it's a time where the destruction of the temple and they're lamenting the loss of their sense of where is God. Lament is important to bring about healing and a healing to finding new life. Ability to name the grief and the pain. While we feel an excitement for Easter, the, a joy coming back together, we must not overlook the impact of these past two years. If we do not make space to express it or tend to these heartaches and losses, there's a very real chance that these aches and wounds will find expression or resurface in rather unhealthy ways, even destructive ways, whether personally or communally. Easter Sunday, I want to invite you to bring a picture of someone to whom you've lost. Uh, it can be digital. You can send it to, to church. We'll give you instructions on that. Or it can be a framed picture. Bring a framed picture to church uh, the week before Easter Sunday. Today, though, I want to provide space to grieve those who have passed away during the pandemic, whether or not caused by COVID-19. You know, due to the social distancing measures, it may not have an adequate space, many not adequate space, to grieve significant loss. I'll ask you a few questions. What do I grieve personally in these past two weeks, years? What do we grieve as a church? What is painful or difficult in your life? The world and in church right now. What losses have you experienced? What do you grieve? What hurts? What is your longing, your hope, your fear? What are you asking God for? Where are you seeing God in the midst of whatever you've gone through? The Apostle Paul says in the letter of Romans, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Romans 12, 15. Let's take time this morning, this Sunday, as we move towards Easter Sunday for allowing space for God to build new life within us. Uh, for us to grieve, to lament. Let's bow in prayer. God, we give you thanks that uh, you set the pattern for us. And uh, Lord, you're the one who entered into our pain and our suffering. Lord, we want to lay before you our sin, the areas in which uh, these past couple of years that have been really difficult God, we invite you to enter in, to do a new work within us. Begin the healing process as we name those things in our life that need healing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you so much for inviting us to share about Yakima Habitat. We know your time is your most valued and limited resource. Since your church has been supporting us for years, many of you already know of us. Please allow me to share some details. I truly appreciate you giving me the next few minutes to tell you about our program. Yakima Valley Partners Habitat for Humanity is a Christian-based affordable housing developer in Yakima. Seeking to put God's love into action, Yakima Valley Partners Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build homes, community, and hope with a vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to call home. To date, we've built 198 homes, helping more than 800 individuals with permanent affordable housing in Yakima County. Through our tithing program, we have financed the construction of more than 165 homes internationally and sent building groups on numerous global builds missions in countries like Nepal, Myanmar, El Salvador, and Colombia. Currently, we have several projects in Yakima, including The Vine, our first ever solar-ready development of 10 homes, a couple homes in Sunnyside, and a single home development in partnership with NCAC in Wapato. While our main mission is to develop affordable housing, we focus on our full mission with our participants, helping them to fully understand the responsibilities of home ownership, being a good neighbor, and preparing them for their future. With the support and engagement of our community, we help integrate our homeowners into their neighborhoods. Our participants not only assist with building their own home, but they must also complete financial literacy programs, obtain a mortgage, and commit to a lifelong commitment and partnership with Yakima Habitat. Our keys for success in keeping our homes affordable are our collaborations, partnerships, and volunteer support. Utilizing these partnerships, we are able to keep the construction cost of our homes at a minimum. We seek first partnerships in everything we do. We currently partner with multiple youth build programs where we offer hands-on experience to students in construction throughout the county. We utilize work-study programs for many of our volunteer positions through People for People, WorkSource, and local schools. Everything down to our t-shirts are done with partnerships in mind. Another major component of our success is our Habitat Store. We have the largest habitat store in the Northwest. The profits from this store finance approximately four homes a year. The store focuses on recycle, reuse, repurpose, helping to reduce the amount of waste being sent to our landfills. You might ask how you can support Yakima Habitat, and there are a variety of ways. You can volunteer your time with us 
We have volunteer opportunities on job sites, at the store, at the admin office, and with most of our events. We provide safety and training so there's no experience necessary. Another way you can support us is through your donations to the store. If you're remodeling, spring cleaning, purging, or just redecorating, you can donate your used, no longer needed items to our store. We'll even come and pick them up for you. And of course, we're always happy to take cash donations. We appreciate your interest in Habitat and any support you might lend to us. Thank you again for your time and consideration. So we thank you for joining us today for this service, and we pray a special blessing over you as you go about your week. Blessings and enjoy your day.